Uh, today, we'll be looking at outstanding problems in Sino-Tibetan comparison. It's kind of a necessary uh, scientific task, and we'll give you a sense of you know, where the field is, what we've managed to achieve, and what is still staring us in the face as problems. So uh, sometimes it's easy, and I won't be discussing these cases. Um, I give uh, paragraph references to my book. Uh, either the three languages have the same thing, then we can reconstruct that thing, like in the case of final K, or there are straightforward correspondences uh, that point to a merger in one or the other language, like we get in the case of glottal stop or Q. In some cases, the resonant files are also pretty easy, including the, these reconstructions I feel uh, less comfortable with, like the RL reconstruction, but where the correspondence is clear. That one, this RL, is the most common of the resonant correspondences, which is maybe a little bit concerning. And the reconstruction is, is probably wrong. Okay, as we've mentioned before, in some cases, distinguishing final R and final RL is hard. In particular, there are two examples. In the first one, there, there happen to be uh, almost identical words for neck in Tibetan, one that ends with an L and one that ends with an R. And in the second case, it's, it's unclear whether the Chinese word should be uh, compared to the word uh, fair or the word clear in Tibetan. And which comparison you choose uh, will determine which um, final you reconstruct. Of course, maybe this points to some, I don't know, morphological process in Tibetan that needs to be um, looked into. But with only two examples, the chances of doing that, uh, you know, successfully at the moment don't seem uh, super high. All right, now turning to vowels, we can get uh, back to a six vowel theory pretty pretty easily, more or less saying uh, the proto-language was a lot like Chinese. So according to Handel, all languages but Chinese merge A ah and schwa, but this is not correct. Burmese changes schwa J into I, so changes O into E. Uh, and, and this is a distinct outcome from its A uh, J correspondence. Here's, should be A J, I've made a typo, but you can see that it's A J. And note that Tongut also uh, draws this distinction between A ah and Schwa in, in limited context. So here's the general pattern, which is um, something we call brightening. It seems to have happened uh, late and independently in a bunch of uh, languages related to Tongut. Uh, but here's the general pattern. So you have, uh, you know, Z for eat rather than Za in, in Tongut. Um, but schwa changes to uh, you uh, in words like ear and love. So that means not only Burmese, but also Tongut has some evidence of the schwa versus ah uh, distinction, which means that Handel's uh, idea is wrong. So one of the most interesting, I think, problems in Sino-Tibetan is uh, this Nga-Ka variation. And uh, these, I think, uh, it's worth actually talking through every example so that, so that you kind of have them in your mind. So for, um, for this word that means war or conflict, Burmese uh, has a uh, let's say Proto-Burmish has dzik, whereas uh, Tibetan points to something like zeng in the, in the Proto-language. Similarly for heart, uh, we, Tibetan and Chinese have a clear ing final, uh, but Burmese has ik. And for year, Tibetan and Chinese have ing, Burmese has ik. Uh, for wood, Burmese has ik, Tibetan and Chinese have ing, uh, and again for nu. So these are the examples I've collected. There aren't very many, and in all of them, Tibetan and Chinese have ing, and Burmese has ik. So it looks like a kind of a Burmese innovation. Yeah. 
But as we uh, talked about a couple of days ago, Achong, which is cl closely related to Burmese, it has this word sang for tree that uh, agrees with Chinese and Tibetan against Burmese, even though it's a language that's clearly closely related to Burmese. So this shows that this, this alternation, this um, ing, ik thing existed at the level of um, Proto-Burmish, or it's a loan word from Jingpo. Those are the two options. Uh, and I just want to point out that there's this uh, little language, Bailong, only preserved in three poems in the Ho Han Shu from the very early part of our era, I think around 50 AD. I would have to check though. And, and in this language, the word for heart agrees with Tibetan. So you have a, a ning uh, for heart, but you have sik for wood, like in uh, the Burmish languages. So I think this um, evidence from Bailong is extremely important because it shows that you, 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 you're, we're not going to be able to solve this problem with sound change. It's not going to be that like, oh, Burmese changed ing into ik in some environment. That's not going to work. The alternation has to be reconstructed at the Proto-Sino-Tibetan level uh, because it exists in Proto-Burmish, possibly. It exists in Bailong. And then um, we can imagine, I think, that in all of these words, uh, there was some kind of ing ik alternation in the Proto-language. And the Tibetan and Chinese went for the ing you know, favored the ing versions and Burmese favored the ik versions for whatever reason. Uh, and then other languages, you know, still continue a mix maybe. Um, so uh, ik versus ing is not predictive of subgroup affiliation uh, and, it, and, it, and it can't be solved with uh, regular phonology. So I would, uh, or like I'm inspired to compare this to um, uh, heteroclites in in um, Indo-European. So for instance, within Germanic, we get fawn for fire in Gothic, and we get Old English feuer. We don't need to go into the Indo-European details, but basically there are different case forms uh, and you get different um, analogical leveling. So, so some languages go with the nominative and they, and they analogically spread it. Uh, some go with, other, with the, the sort of oblique stem and analogically spread it. And I'm not saying that we had case like this in Sino-Tibetan, but I think there was clearly some kind of morphological alternation in the proto-language between ing and ik uh, in, in, in a, a core set of uh, basic nouns. That's the explanation that I currently prefer. Moving just on to other, you know, irregularities. Here we have uh, unexpected N in Chinese. Now, just keep in mind that any given N in Chinese might be better reconstructed as an R, so this isn't that big a deal. Uh, so we have unexpected N in Chinese where we have R in Tibetan, so we sort of want the N to be an R in Chinese. We also have an unexpected N in uh, Chinese where uh, Tibetan has an L, so again, we want the Chinese to be an R, but here we would point to an RL reconstruction. Um, and we have unexpected N in Chinese, where we have uh, an open syllable in Tibetan. And in these cases, we don't want the N. We don't want the N to be an R. We don't want the N period in Chinese. So um, who knows what's going on there? Probably some kind of suffix, maybe. There are a lot of N suffixes floating around in Sino-Tibetan. Uh, but in any case, it's a problem to be solved. We also have the so the reverse, if you like, those are the unexpected Ns in Chinese, your unexpected Rs. And now similarly, you might suspect that maybe Baxter and Cigar have incorrectly reconstructed R here because R and N are hard to distinguish in Chinese. Um, but we would, uh, we would like to have N in these cases because that's what Tibetan has and, uh, and Burmese when it comes up. More examples of the same. In an intriguing, rare correspondence, uh, to uh, Chinese has a final M where one expects P based on the other languages. So here we have a shadow where uh, Tibetan and Burmese point to a final P, uh, and Chinese has a final M. And needle, which I think we've seen on various occasions for various reasons, and I've ignored this complication because I don't have an answer for it. Definitely these. Um, 
seem similar enough that one expects that they're cognates. And then also sometimes we can have an unexpected T in Chinese. Uh, and I'll just uh, talk through these examples. We have rice, where you see uh, Chinese has a T final and Tibetan has an S final. And then uh, pitch pipe, where Chinese has a T and Tibetan has an S. Uh, cigar makes a very good argument for uh, the, the semantics of bone being cognate with pitch pipe that has to do with how you made pitch pipes in, in um, ancient China. And then uh, this example of, of dig. So uh, I have suggested in the past, uh, I think following an idea of Simon's, although I don't quite remember, that Tibetan S sometimes uh, comes from a TS cluster. And that could be invoked uh, here for rice and for bone, uh, but it can't be used for, um, for dig. OK, and then sometimes. Chinese has an unexpected ng final, like in itch and in this word uh, ancient times or in the past. Okay, we also have an uh, unexpected d in Tibetan. For instance, we in Old Chinese is nge, but in, uh, in Tibetan it's ned. Okay, now turning to the vowels. We have uh, Tibetan E where we expect an A, so A where we expect A. We just saw this example of we, uh, but there are other examples as well. And some more examples. All right, we sometimes have Proto Burmish U where we expect A. For example, in the word for uh, house in Tibetan, if we, if we compare that to uh, roof. In Burmese, remember that Burmese O before Beelers comes from Proto Burmish U. So in Proto Burmish, it's something like Kung. I don't think it's a coincidence that roof is Kung in Proto Burmish and Kang in Tibetan, uh, but uh, we don't have any way of getting between an U and an A in that way. And similarly with uh, be scared. Uh, Tibetan and Chinese point to an ak final, but uh, Burmese points to uk. Okay, and then Chinese sometimes has uh, an a shua where we expect an i. And again, this I think might just be uh, that it's hard to reconstruct Chinese correctly, that there are certain kinds of mergers in Chinese. Um, but I guess here are the examples. Uh, the first one, uh, crumbs, prohibit in uh, Chinese, and crims, law or or right in uh, Tibetan. And then the second one, I think, is is quite nice to point out because it's a it's a grammatical affix, and so um, the, the there might well have been uh, exceptional correspondences because of uh, vowel reduction in uh, unstressed syllables, something like that. So you have a genitive g in um, in Chinese and gi in Tibetan. Yeah, and then in these two cases, Chinese has an e vowel instead of an i. So sometimes we get shua, shua instead of i, sometimes we get e instead of i. But this is this is a rare one, only in these two words. So difficulties with r. Tibetan sometimes has uh, a consonant, uh, let's say particularly velars, uh, plus r, so in sort of phonotactic terms, an initial velar and a medial r, uh, where Burmese or Chinese have initial r. So just to look at these in a little more detail, in the first one, Chinese and Tibetan have krang, uh, but Burmese just has rang. In the second, uh, similar, uh, you have krap and krap in in um, uh, Tibetan and, and Chinese, but then you just have ryap with an interesting um, medial y as well. Um, in in those two, you see agreement between Tibetan and Chinese, uh, but then in the in the in the third one, which maybe isn't a, such a great comparison actually, uh, you have gra in Tibetan, but just ra in. 
Chinese. And in the last one, cold, these are definitely related. Grung in Tibetan and an unspecified prefix. So maybe it's it's a K prefix and then everything would be fine in a sense in Chinese. Uh, so anyhow, that's one set of complications. And now another one where Tibetan has RY and Chinese has R. And now maybe one solution is to just reconstruct a medial R, uh, sorry, a medial Y for the Chinese words in this case, but that would seem a little bit ad hoc. So, um, so we have flow, which is ryu in, in let's say, pre-Tibetan, uh, but uh, ru in Chinese. And let's go down to the last one because it's quite famous. Hundred brya in pre-Tibetan, rya in uh, in Burmese, and prak with no sign of a middle ya in uh, in Chinese. So this is a distinction I make orthographically, where r y gives us rya or yeah, so rya gives us rya. This is Lee's law, uh, but then I also have this. R uh, superscript Y to mean sort of palatalization, uh, which is uh, gives us Benedict's law, and that's how I I index these two different outcomes of Tibetan. And I do think that I don't know that, that you might find that overly mechanical, but uh, uh, then tell me uh, another solution. It's clear it's clear that there were two kinds of R Y in pre-Tibetan, if you like, uh, and in this case uh, we just have R in Chinese, so n rux for night. Uh, but uh, but we have RY evidence for RY in both Burmese and in uh, Tibet. Now maybe this points to that Baxter and Cigar, you know, should be doing something else here. So they should um, understand maybe that palatalized R uh, changes to Ya in Middle Chinese, and that they should not reconstruct the the end prefix. Who knows? Um, but in case I think uh, there are some interesting examples. Now PR in Tibetan and R in other languages. So we have, you know, uh, we just mentioned hundred where Burmese is kind of missing the, the, the P initial for some reason. Uh, and then the same thing in, um, in, in breast or breastplate. But in this case, uh, let's say Chinese and Burmese are compatible with a uvular initial, uh, but Tibetan has a, a labial. Okay. And then um, also with uh, T, R, where Tibetan has uh, uh, T, R, or D, R, and uh, the other two languages don't have the cluster. And then I think this one, indigo, is probably a loan word into Tibetan from Chinese, maybe at, at some point where some of the things had disappeared, but it was still an R and not an L. I'm not sure, but I, I don't, somehow I don't think indigo is a Sino-Tibetan word. Lots of complicated correspondences involving R that seem to have to do with, uh, with prefixes either being maintained or not before uh, R. Okay, we have a lot of the similar problems with L, unsurprisingly. So uh, you can you can see them here, where um, you know generally Tibetan has more going on than uh, the other languages, but it can be more complicated than that. Um, let's look at arrow. So in arrow, Tibetan and Burmese have mla, uh, but Chinese has some loose pre initial. Maybe it, it was with an with an m. Also a slight semantic uh, difference there. And then in the in the last one, ground. So Tibetan has a seems to have a G prefix, uh, Burmese an M prefix, and uh, Chinese no prefix at all. So there are some complications with laterals. Maybe let's look at four, which is the second on this page. So you have a B prefix in, in Tibetan and Kurtop, uh, nothing in Burmese and an S prefix in Chinese. So some, 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 some mysteries here that need to be solved. And then um, there are also cases where it's, it's unclear whether R or L is the initial. So in the word for neck, uh, Tibetan and Burmese point to an L, but Chinese points to an R. And in uh, joyful, 
Tibetan uh, has an R and Chinese has an L. Now, um, one question that we've raised earlier is uh, whether or not to reconstruct a ya. Uh, we actually were discussing it about Chinese, uh, but now about uh, Sino-Tibetan. So there are cases where Tibetan and Burmese both have ya, and Chinese has, uh, you know, let's say, something not too far from ya uh, in Middle Chinese, but where Baxter and Cigar reconstruct uh, uvulars. And um, Guillaume Jacques and Axel Schussler suggest uh, that in these sorts of environments, we should reconstruct a, a, a ya all the way back. Uh, Baxter and Cigar kind of reply to this criticism in um, their answer to Schussler's review in Diachronica and point out that uh, most of the Tibetan cognates do have a G in them. So um, maybe their uvular idea is not so bad after all. In any case, I, I don't have a firm opinion on, on this particular question. Now, the origin of uh, Chinese voiceless resonance. So we have uh, voiceless resonance in, in Burmese, but we know where they come from. Where do they come from in Chinese? Well, you would be tempted, maybe, especially if you were, you know, Meizulin, you would say uh, these come from S clusters. So uh, the word black, uh, you know, uh, muck actually started as smuck, something like that. But that's not going to work um, because we have reconstructed S clusters in Baxter and Cigar system for other reasons. So where do these voiceless resonance come from? Uh, one idea that I think I saw somewhere very recently discussed, although I don't remember where, is that, uh, they, that it has to do with the loose tight uh, distinction where something like this, tight initial S's uh, became voiceless resonance and then loose uh, initial S's became tight initial S's after that. And that might explain what's going on in Chinese. Uh, but in any case, it's a problem that needs to be addressed. What is the origin of voiceless resonance in Chinese? Uh, and, and can uh, comparisons shed any light on that? Here are just a few more examples. And a few more examples. OK, and now one of the big uh, conjectures that would relate uh, Tibetan and Burmese, so uh, this idea of Schiefner's that Burmese has, I mean, this is how he put it, has in some cases an aspirated consonant as an initial where Tibetan uses a superscript S. So in kind of more modern terminology in the framework I'm using, we can state this conjecture more precisely as where Proto-Burmish has a preglottalized resonant Tibetan has an, an S resonant uh, cluster. So there's a lot of evidence that supports this. Uh, for instance, heart, nose, mucus, bamboo, ripe. Uh, but there are also counterexamples. In particular, moon and snake. In the example of moon, Lashi actually does have a preglottalized initial. So we so there's something going on inside of Burmish. And I suspect it's actually that um uh, yeah, you can't tell it from the from the orthography in Burmese, but there's a creaky tone in Burmese. So it uh you can see that with the capital X in Lashi. And um so let's assume that Lashi is something like the Proto-Burmish form. I wonder whether when preglottalized changed into voiceless resonance in Burmese, there was some kind of uh, conditioning whereby that didn't happen in, in, in the creaky tone because it's sort of too many you know, glottal features. I'm not sure. What we, what we can say very confidently is the example moon is a counterexample to Schiefner's conjecture from the perspective of Burmese, uh, but, from the, from, but it's a kind of, per, it's a proto-Burmish to Burmese problem. It's not a Sino-Tibetan problem. Whereas uh, snake is uh, is maybe more of a problem. So we have counterexamples where uh, Tibetan lacks an S as well. 
Um, so let's look at Baro, where uh, Burmese points to preglottalized uh, initial in Proto Burmish, but the Tibetan word is Brnya, not Bsnya. Yeah. So you can see here paths of investigation, like, I don't know, maybe R prefixes in Tibetan are actually uh, rhoticized S prefixes in some cases, or maybe um, uh, Schiefner's conjecture only addresses some sources of preglottalized initials in, in Proto-Burmish, and in other cases, uh, there were other prefixes that, that caused it, for instance, um, in, in two, uh, where Tibetan has uh, a, a, a velar prefix. Maybe it's that velar prefix that caused the preglobalization in um, um, Proto-Burmish. But in any case, they're counterexamples uh, to Schiefner's conjecture. Now, there are circumstances where there's disagreement on the uh, manner of the initial obstruent. So places where Proto-Burmish is unexpectedly voiced, and now remember that Burmese doesn't have a voicing distinction. So, so we take an aspiration distinction of Burmese back to a, um, a voicing distinction in Proto-Burmish because of the Burmish tonal split. So if we look at all, we have gun in Burmese or in Proto-Burmish and kun in Tibetan. Um, for slave or servant, we have gyun in uh, Burmese, Kol in Tibetan and Krons in Chinese. It, it, the comparisons, you know, it's 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 tantalizing, but they don't just line up perfectly. Okay. Here are more examples uh, where a proto burmish is unexpectedly voiced, uh, and they include, for instance, the number one. So you have a, uh, you know, pro proto burmish or or let's say. Trans-Himalayan from the Burmese perspective would give you a deck uh, where you have tech in Chinese and good tech in, in Tibetan. Okay, Chinese uh, can be unexpectedly voiceless. Uh, so here's this example I gave from elbow. Uh, then there's also nine. And in some of these cases, you, you might suspect that it's actually uh, Tibetan has voiced for some reason. Maybe there was a little schwa before uh, uh, before the application of a prefix, something like that. But it's a it's 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 a problem to solve. Uh, so unexpected uh, voiceless initials in Chinese, and a few more examples, and even uh, some more Chinese unexpected voiceless stops. Okay, now there's an idea of. Um, Guillaume Jacques that would get rid of uh, some of these, which is that Chinese pre-nasalization corresponds to Tibetan voicing. So from the perspective of Sino-Tibetan, what you would say is you had pre-nasalized stops, you had like, you had, you had uh, maybe voice, voiceless and pre-nasalized stops in Sino-Tibetan, and the pre-nasalized stops stayed pre-nasalized in Chinese, and they merged with the voice stops in Tibetan. Very nice idea. I wish it were unambiguously true. Here are some examples that kind of uh, would make you think that. So hold in the mouth, we get, you know, uh, I don't know, some consonant and then mm, uh, gum in Chinese, and we get uh, gum in uh, Tibetan. So yeah, maybe the G comes from the pre-nasalization in, in the word for shield or contradict, you know, we get a G in uh, Proto-Burmish and Tibetan and an MK in Chinese. So maybe this mka, maybe the, the m voice, the ka in uh, Tibetan and uh, Burmese. So it's a nice idea, but it only gets us some of the examples. And um, uh, let's say, uh, uh, I, yeah, this is just to give the evidence that actually Guillaume Jacques presented in his paper where he was actually presenting uh, corresponds between pre-nasalization in in uh, Yaronic languages with um, with voiced in in Tibetan, which is of course you know not the same idea, but it's the same kind of idea, which is we're explaining some of the uh, Tibetan voiced consonants as coming from pre-nasalization. So um, 
the problem is that many of these uh, voiced initials in Tibetan correspond with just plain uh, voiceless in Chinese. I've gone through those examples already. Uh, and, and they don't correspond with an, an uh, pre-nasalized um, initial in Chinese. So at best, uh, this conjecture of Guillaume Jacques only gets us a little bit of the way in the direction we want to go. Uh, but in uh, his review of my book, where I where he sort of noticed that I had discussed this idea of his and was a little bit critical of it by saying, well, it doesn't get us very far, and here's a good example. Um, I, I, let's say, I discuss this example, which then he uh, has an answer for, which I will, which I will present you in a moment. So father is uh, nepa in uh, Chinese. So according to his theory, it should be ba in, um, in Tibetan, right? So his, his theory both doesn't explain all the, the pa's that need to be explained in Chinese, and it doesn't explain all the buzz that need to be explained in Tibetan. So maybe not such a great theory. That's that's what I said in my book. Yeah, but uh, he points out that in Limbu, uh, father is usually prefixed uh, in a way that's similar to phenomena I've discussed in Gyarong. But in this case, we're talking about in Limbu, uh, where the prefix is a nasal prefix. So uh, you know, my father is Amba. And your father is, I don't know how to say this, kba. <laughs> um, whereas just father in the abstract, father as an idea, the, 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 the a father is, is, is pa. So he wonders whether uh, there, there might, that this might be uh, similar to what Sino-Tibetan had. And then you have a pretty easy explanation which is that uh, in Chinese, they generalized the prefix form, and in Tibetan, they generalized the unprefix form, which is, uh, to, put it, to put this another way, it, it means that we can keep our story about uh, pre-nasalization leading to voicing in Tibetan, where we say, well, in this case, when that sound change happened, the N prefix was already gone in Tibetan because of morphological leveling. And I'll just point out that the, the Proto-Burmish uh, Proto um, correspondence is also irregular. So Atsi has Wa and not Pa. So maybe that's some evidence of some kind of prefixing going on also in Proto-Burmish. So I think this is, you know, the goal of this presentation is to sort of show you the, 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 cut, the cutting edge of uh, Sino-Tibetan, and, and I, I think this is a good uh, story to tell in terms of um, we've pushed historical phonology a certain distance, and now we know which problems need to be solved. And then in looking to solve those problems, in addition to just finding more and more refined conditioning in our sound changes, we can turn to uh, morphology. Uh, but, but Tibetan and Burmese are not good places to turn to for morphology, whereas Limbu and Gyarong, they are. So I think that's the next you know, generation of scholarship will be uh, looking at uh, morphology in those languages that have it and seeing whether that morphology can explain uh, the irregular phonology that we get. So that whole sort of discussion we just had was about where Chinese has a voiceless initial, where we expect a voiced initial. We also have Tibetan having a voiceless initial where we, where, where Chinese has a, a, a voiced an initial. So the reverse, if you like. So uh, dig, foot, carry, uncle. One Burmese cognate agrees with Tibetan and one agrees with Chinese. Uh, in this one, it's saddle frame where you have Tibetan kal, Burmese gal, and uh, Chinese gai. And then on, on here, it's a, a cut or sharp where, um, where here Burmese agrees with Tibetan. So Tibetan has chot, uh, Chinese has zot, and uh, Burmese has chot. So it's, it's a mess, yeah? Okay, and then in uh, two cases, we, we uh, Tibetan and Burmese disagree. Uh, in one of them, we don't have Chinese. Now we move on to the origin of Chinese aspirate obstruents. 
So just to remind you, yeah, just to remind you, so Tibetan basically, Tibetan has, allows many, many clusters, but fundamentally in terms of uh, manners, um, only opposes uh, voiced and voiceless. Whereas uh, Burmese doesn't really allow many clusters and Burmese itself has voiceless and voiceless aspirate, but that goes back to voiced, voiceless, preglottalized. And that may even go back to a voiced, voiceless, uh, voice preglottalized, voiceless preglottalized. Chinese has a three-way contrast in manner, voiced, voiceless, and voiceless aspirate. So it, 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 the, just these kind of broad categories don't match very well among the languages. And we would end uh, the aspirate obstruents in Chinese are relatively rare. So I think a lot of people feel like they're secondary and we should get rid of them somehow, but uh, it's not clear how. So in many cases, uh, aspirate in Chinese corresponds to a, a, a plain obstruent in the other two languages. Here are some examples. Uh, maybe just look at bitter, which is one of the you know, clearest, best Chinese cognates out there. Sorry, Sino-Tibetan cognates out there. Uh, so what, why is uh, the Chinese aspirated where the other two are unaspirated? Not clear. Uh, also, uh, Chinese aspirates can correspond to voice stops in Tibetan and Burmese. Uh, for instance, in, let's say, in bend, where you have uh, krok, in, uh, krok in Chinese and guks in Tibetan. Or maybe a uh, scatter divide is an even better example. Prai in uh, Chinese, where you have bre, sorry, bral in Tibetan and pra in, in Burmese, which goes back to bra. So the Burmese and the and the Tibetan uh, tend to uh, agree, and something is causing uh, devoicing and aspiration in Chinese. You know, our big problem in in, in Chinese, uh, let's say, summing up, are the, the voiceless resonance and these aspirate stops. So now uh, we turn to the big problems in Tibetan, which generally have to do with palatalization. So there are, you can understand there as being three, I think, let's say at least conceptually speaking, it may not be what happened historically, but conceptually speaking, we have three kinds of palatalization in Tibetan. We have Houghton's law, which changes nga into nya, conditioned by some palatalizing environment. And we have la changes to zhe, conditioned by some palatalizing environment. And then we have lots of other palatalization. Now, these palatalizations we sort of aren't as interesting to look at because they don't lead to mergers, they lead to splits. Yeah. So, um, so they're still, you know, clearly uh, present in the in the uh, language. And the conditioning environment for for all of these is unclear although you know as you would expect uh, high front vowels sure help yeah so so it, it, it there are more and more examples with i uh, so with i there's the most examples with e there's fewer examples but there are examples with all vowels including a ah. so it doesn't have to do with the vowels i think in a, in a way the easiest thing to do is just say is just to reconstruct the palatalizing environment all the way back, and then to say that before the vowel i, um, that palatalizing feature was was automatic. You know, that's that's a way that um, a lot of languages are, are analyzed uh, synchronically, including, for instance, um, Anton Lustig's analysis of Zywa. So, um, with that said, we have to distinguish two palatalizing environments because the palatalizations happened hundreds of years apart from each other. So Houghton's law is shared with the East Bodish languages. So it's not the same thing that um, that triggered these other palatalizations, right? So we have to have at least, you know, if, if, if we're reconstructing things mechanically, we can say, well, we'll just reconstruct a, a, a superscript Y as whatever the palatalizing environment is, but we have to do two, one for Houghton's Law and one for everything else. And uh, now we're ending up with a, a quite sort of algebraic uh, uh, proto-language, which I don't feel super comfortable with. And we need to figure out like what actually is the phonetic environment that caused uh, Houghton's Law or these other palatalizations. And I think that's one of the, the big open questions. Yeah. Here are the examples of Houghton Law's 
Houghton's law, just to remind you, and you see that um, that Kurtope agrees with uh, Tibetan against Burmese and Chinese. So Kurtope uh, underwent Houghton's law. Now, an idea that's worth discussing to uh, make uh, the correspondences nicer. Uh, Nishida uh, points out, and particularly based on this word six, that Tibetan has dr, where Burmese has kr. Um, and actually, Nishida thought that uh, Burmese was innovative in these cases, uh, but I think uh, Chinese points points you in the direction that it's probably um, it's probably Tibetan that has innovated. Now, the reason I have this uh, proposal here and not in an earlier presentation is it's not the case that uh, you, you can set this up as a across the board um, innovation. You know, it's not like every place Burmese has uh, uh, KR, Tibetan has uh, TR, DR. It's not that easy. So there's something going on, but uh, we don't, let's put it this way, don't know the conditioning environment. Okay. And East Bodish does not participate in this innovation. So it's um, it's quite late in the history of Tibetan. So you can say, well, uh, for Sino-Tibetan purposes, we will just um, remember when you see DR in Tibetan, ask yourself whether it's an old DR or a new DR. And you can check that by looking at East Bodish. And yes, it's a problem, but it's a problem that we can solve uh, in the context of Tibetan and not worry about in the context of, of Sino-Tibetan. So just to give, you know, one example, we'll, we'll talk about six because, you know, it's the, it's the best example of, of this whole uh, kettle of fish. Uh, Druk in Tibetan, but Grok in Bumtap and Kro in Dakpa. So yeah, we have a clear velar. So the, so the dental initial is late in Tibetan. So now we come back to Schiefner's connect, uh, conjecture. We did it first with the resonance. Now we're going to do it with the obstruents. And um, it's more complicated because uh, in, in Burmese, we have um, two sources of aspirate obstruents, right? Plain, voiceless obstruents and preglottalized obstruents. So I sort of asked myself, I mean, uh, how, how, how would you phrase Schiefner's conjecture now if knowing more about uh, uh, Proto-Burmish than he knew? And I think it would be that an, an SP, where P is any um, voiceless obstruent, SP would correspond in Tibetan to preglottalized P in Proto-Burmish. So here are examples. Just look at borrow um, as, as one case. So you have pre godlized K I Y in, in Proto Burmish and S K Y I in, um, in Tibetan. It's quite a good, uh, you know, seems like a very promising conjecture. Yeah. Now, uh, a complication, which is, I think, quite interesting, is uh, we also have S B corresponding to pre godlized P in. Uh, in proto burmish So for instance, in the word for hill, uh, in this case, we actually can't prove that the proto burmish was pre glottalized because I haven't been able to find it in other uh, Burmish languages, but let's give it the benefit of the doubt. Um, and then most saliently in frog, yeah? Uh, so frog clearly goes back to a pre glottalized P in proto burmish uh, but an SB in, um, in Tibetan. And this suggests, I'll try and say it slowly and carefully, um, starting from the perspective of Burmese and working backwards. At the Burmese level, all we have is a distinction between P and PH. But at Proto-Burmish, we've been able to rewrite that as a BP distinction and realize that there's a third series, preglottalized P, and that the P and the preglottalized P merge on their way to Burmese, right? This evidence suggests that we, and we can't reconstruct this at, at the Proto-Burmish level. Uh, it's only with some Tibetan evidence, so we can call it the sort of pre-Proto-Burmish level, that we have a fourth series, 
which you can understand as a preglottalized voiced obstruent. So then we would have, you know, P, B, uh, preglottalized P, preglottalized B. So frog, I think, is uh, the best comparative uh, evidence for that. Uh, but there's also some Burmese internal evidence having to do with um, causatives. So we have this verb to be afraid, gruk, and we have the causative to frighten or scare, which reconstructs to preglottalized kruk in Proto Burmish. But I think purely, uh, you know, for reasons of um, elegance in terms of internal reconstruction, you can take that one a step further back and say, well, maybe it was actually, you know, gruk and preglottalized gruk, where the preglottalization is a, is a sign of some kind of causative prefix. You know, maybe ultimately an S. So you could reconstruct almost entirely uh, on Burmese internal evidence. You could do something like gruk and zgruk, uh, which is just to say that, that then um, this hypothesis that has emerged from frog and the comparison with Tibetan has some uh, Burmese internal evidence as well that suggests we can we can imagine that kind of pre-proto Burmish, let's call it, had four-way manner contrast in obstruents. Okay. So that shows us that Schiefner's conjecture is is really good. You know, it's really exciting. It really gets us a lot of work done, uh, but there are exceptions. So we have cases where um, the P in Burmese it is, is not preglottalized. For example, in star. Ah, but curiously, again, like we saw in moon for the resonance, Lashi shows it is preglottalized. So it's not an exception from the from the Sino-Tibetan perspective. It's a Burmese internal problem. Uh, but uh, it, this doesn't always help us. So for instance, the word green, Burmese and Lashi agree that it's not preglottalized, whereas Tibetan unambiguously has an S initial. So what do we do about that? I don't have an answer. It's an exception to Schiefner's conjecture. Uh, and then here are two more uh, a, examples, uh, but I have put them onto this slide by themselves because I'm going to talk more about them. So uh, the word body looks like nice cognates, right? So you have SKU in Tibetan, SKU, maybe something like GU in Proto-Burmish, and then KO in, in Chinese. Uh, but it is an exception to Schiefner's conjecture because you would expect to have some kind of preglottalization in Proto-Burmish. And then uh, if we look at Ni, uh, you have uh, spusmo in Tibetan, uh, and then you have, uh, it's actually pronounced in Burmese, puchi, sorry, or actually it would be pusi, uh, but let's go with something like puchach um, in, in, in terms of the spelling. Uh, so from here, again, Burmese, we would expect to have an aspirate in order to confer, conform to uh, Schiefner's conjecture. But a few thoughts. Uh, the Burmese word might well be a loan from Pali, Kaya, as the final Y indicates. In, in, indigenous, uh, uh, indigenous Burmese words would not have a final Y in this uh, phonotactic position. Uh, and the pre aspiration in Lashi suggests that uh, Burmese uh, it, it, it has innovated. You know, it also has lost the final T. It's probably a, a, a reduction in compound, right? So you actually would have had something like put uh, chach, and then it becomes puchach uh, in compound. So maybe these two problems aren't, aren't real. And I think that that shows you, you know, that we can, that we're posing the right questions. And making some progress. Okay. We also have the reverse. So, the, so these were examples where uh, we have an S in Tibetan and we don't have a preglottalization in, in Burmese, but we also have where we have a preglottalization in Burmese, but we don't have an S in Tibetan. Uh, so um, for instance, this word for male or armor, krap in Tibetan, krap in 
uh, in Chinese for shell, but Burmese uh, and, well, and Proto-Burmish has a preglottalized initial when we don't have an explanation for that. So I won't go through the other examples. Um, and then uh, just to sort of end this discussion of preglottalized uh, uh, initials in Proto-Burmish and their cognates in Sino-Tibetan, we I remind you of the bizarre word otter, where Lashi has a preglottalized uh, sha, so sham, which looks very nice in comparison to sram in Tibetan, uh, but uh, but Burmese has pyam, so there's something there's something really strange going on in the word for otter, uh, but it, um, it it certainly doesn't argue against Schiefner's conjecture. Now to uh, sibilance, uh, Chinese only has one, it's S. Yeah, so Sino-Tibetan from the Chinese perspective, you say, oh, well, it had S. And from Tibetan's perspective, you can say there are two, S and SH. I mean, to some extent that reverts to the problem I just talked about, which is why does Tibetan palatalize? Yeah. And then for Proto-Burmish, we have four sibilants, S, preglottalized S, palatalized S, and preglottalized palatalized S. The three languages point to a very different inventory of sibilants, and the correspondences are a total mess. Um, here we have cognates of, of Proto-Burmish S. Um, here are cognates of, of Proto-Burmish uh, preglottalized S, where, well, we have this srok in Tibetan. Maybe the R has something to do with the preglottalization. I don't know. Uh, we have to kill, where you know maybe the G prefix in Tibetan or the the R, the apparent R infix in Chinese are what's cognate with the preglottalization. It's really not uh, very clear. Yeah. Uh, and then we have uh, these sh examples in Proto-Burmish, where uh, we have drink. Well. Um, I think this, this word is pretty clearly cognate to this uh, Chinese word, uh, but here we have SR in, in Chinese corresponding to sh rather to pre than to preglottalized S. So just to you know, prove the, the, the correspondences are a mess. Yeah. And then we can't talk about uh, sibilance in Proto-Burmish without again reminding ourselves about what uh, what a strange little beast otter is. And here I throw in a Chinese word for otter, which does not look like a particularly good comparison, but it sort of doesn't look particularly worse than the other comparisons. So, you know, might as well throw it up there, I thought. Yeah. So that's otter. Now, uh, just uh, talking about uh, S's and RS, uh, uh, Guillaume Jacques has this conjecture that Burmese sh, so, uh, a voiceless R from the Burmese perspective and a preglottalized R from the Proto-Burmish perspective comes from SR. And he points to uh, these two examples. So color, sex, or shame, which he thinks is cognated with a shamed and uh, shame in Japu Gyarong, and uh, alive, uh, where you have SR in Chinese and shang in uh, Burmese. Uh, but I have another, I propose another cognate for ashamed, which is that it's, um, that it's cognate with red in uh, Chinese and blood in, um, in uh, Tibetan. And why do I propose that? It seems like proposing that shame is cognate with shame is much more straightforward, right? Well, it's because it works in terms of my uh, proposals for historical phonology, which is that you had, you know, a, a nice uvular onset and the uvulars dropped in Burmese and the uvular becomes a, a velar in Tibetan. So the phonology, it just couldn't be better. Uh, and um, it is extremely normal across the world uh, to have uh, a semantic change. Red goes to ashamed because people blush when, when they're ashamed. So, um, yeah, so I, which is not to say that uh, Guillaume Jacques' ideas are bad or even wrong. I think maybe uh, these, these, um, this, these other words can be brought into the story somehow. 
uh, but I feel very fond of my comparison and I'm not ready to give it up. Yeah. Uh, and his uh, second cognate proposal, so he only has you know, two examples uh, of this correspondence, uh, the vowels don't work. So, you know, maybe that's a problem. Yeah, you, you, what should you have gotten in, in, in Burmese? Maybe that's a, <laughs> a good uh, quiz item. Well, I'll just tell you. Yeah, Eng should have gone to Ing, and then Ing should have gone to, that's uh, Dempsey's law, and then Ing should have gone to Ang, that's uh, Wolfenden's law, so you should have gotten Shang, or it would be pronounced, uh, it actually be pronounced Shi, I think, in, in modern Burmese, but it would be R-H-A-N tilde, N tilde, is what you should have gotten uh, as the vowel correspondence. So, um, you know, I'm not going to say they're not cognate, but it's not a great comparison. Uh, and then just to say, also in my book, I catalog all the one-off correspondences as well. All the kind of, oh, and then here's, you know, I don't know, a, a, a P corresponding to an N or something like that, uh, where you might well think that they're just bad comparisons, but their comparisons ex exist in the literature and, and my temptation is to say, we don't want to overly clean our cognate sets because then we won't find new things. You know, we want to leave some, some mess in there uh, and then we'll have something to, to clean up. But uh, you know, I really didn't think it was a good use of our time or your energy to sort of take, take you through individual examples of sui generis uh, correspondences. Those are all of the, uh, the problems so I will just uh, kind of add a, a word of summary. Uh, what, are, what are the big questions? So in Chinese, they are, what's the origin of the AB distinction? What's the origin of the voiceless resonance? And what's the origin of the aspirate obstruents? In Tibetan, it's basically palatalization. It's wh where did this palatalization come from? I also think Tibetan is probably the best place to look at oblaut, uh, and 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 uh, more philology should be done on uh, the Tibetan verbal system to figure out exactly what the prefixes mean and and where we find the oblauts. Uh, not only in terms of you know naming the stems like oh this you get the present this you get the past, but actually find out what those what those things actually mean. I think that's a a big um, desideratum in in uh, Tibetan. And then in uh, Proto-Burmish, uh, what I talked about had a lot to do with um, Schiefner's conjecture of sort of linking Proto-Burmish and Tibetan. Uh, but actually, in, in the case of Proto-Burmish, we are lucky to have this uh, 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 burmo changik hypothesis, where I think um, just figuring out the next level up, you know, we did we did the Proto-Burmish. So how does Proto-Burmish relate to Lolo-ish? How does Lolo-Burmese really relate to burma Changik? Uh, and then I think in particular, bringing the, the, the velarized, non-velarized vowel distinction that you see across uh, Gyaorong and Changik languages into the picture will be very uh, helpful. And I think that we will end up, um, you know, uh, sorting, we'll end up with, a, let's say, a proto burmo Changik um, that's a much better starting place for comparisons to Tibetan because uh, it will have um, a, a more gorgeous set of onsets and uh, the sources of these uh, pre will be will be more clear. And maybe we'll also have a tidier vowel system that doesn't have this imbalance that currently exists with far more correspondences in open syllables than in closed syllables. That's a nice idea. Yeah. Um, you know, I wish I'd talked to you before I wrote my book um, in terms of, I think, I think um, reconstructing B for the MP correspondence, G for the, for, for where I have K schwa and uh, D for where I have RL would lead to an overall more elegant looking um, Sino-Tibetan uh, 